Collective Experience. If you've watched the videos before, you recognize me. My name is Taylor Kaplan. I'm stoked to be here with you guys again, but even more stoked that this time, instead of talking with you over Zoom, I got Dave here at my home base at the Nimitzel Motorcycle Museum to show you guys what we've got going on here, um, what the scoop is. Dave hasn't been here in a year since before um, we really got this place ramped up and going. So excited to give you guys a tour, um, get Dave from it really familiar, and uh, tell our viewers more about the collective experience and everything we've got going on here. So stay tuned. What's up everybody? So we are starting off in the dirt bike showroom and it's freaking cool because I got a lot of number one plates right behind me and it's all thanks to these two right here. So we've got the man himself, Mr. Kaplan America, Ken Kaplan. And of course, <laughs> you guys know who that is already. If you know the channel, you, you know that face. That's okay. Taylor Kaplan. Uh, they're gonna give us a tour around the, uh, the dirt bike portion just to kind of get started. I know that's what you guys wanna see. That's what I wanna see. And uh, I, I just wanna get the history behind all these number one plays because I'm pretty sure this guy earned them all. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty pumped to hear the history and we're gonna dive right into it. Guys, this is a super cool 1980, really rare. They've made less than a thousand and most of them were destroyed. It's a Kajiva 500cc two stroke. And we nicknamed it the Boss because it's a badass top of the line Italian bike. And if you don't know what FIM stands for, it's Federazione Motocalistica Italiana. <laughs> so, hey, that's the AMA. That's the FIM for Italians or the AMA here, but that's pretty cool. And this says Campione de Motocross. This was the, the Italian champion motocross bike. It came stock with the white powered forks and the uh, uh, Olin shock and aluminum swing arm, uh, Brembo disc brakes, Del Oro carb. It really is a, a world-class race bike from that era. Uh, moving down the line here, we've got a, every 12-year-old kid's dream bike, the Honda CR80R from the 80s. And then we got a 250R. Then we've got my, my personal favorite, a 1986 CR500. This is the first one I ever bought in 1986. Then we got an 85 CR125. Then we've got a 94 KX500. And then another 86 CR500. And then this really cool three-wheel ATC 250R. Uh, they were outlawed because I guess one out of three people that bought one got seriously injured. <laughs> the stats pretty are pretty big odds. <laughs> pretty big odds. <laughs> then we got the Honda SL70, the JT60, and the Honda CR60. And then, of course, no test session will be complete without the world's largest motorcycle, production motorcycle engine, the 2300cc Triumph. This is a kick ass machine. So let's take a, a walk across the bridge back in time to the New England Motorcycle Museum. <laughs> side of me. Here is my collection of, this is really fun, my favorite motorcycle is in the museum. Um, I've got a few replicas that you're definitely going to recognize if you're a 90s moto fan, especially early 2000s. Um, and over here, we've got some doves. <laughs> and that's because once upon a time, a prophet told us that uh, we should put them here for good luck. And for that reason, and that reason alone, we have doves. We haven't quite figured out if it's been worth it yet, but okay, you seem pretty happy here. <laughs> What's better luck, the uh, the RC replica or the doves? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> the RC replica seems to be the winner thus far. <laughs> that's an RC replica, but the one in the middle is actually Doug Henry's. If you look at the title, that's Doug Henry's. That was a present from Honda from him, and uh, they gave it to him in '96. That's actually Doug's bike on display here. And then we have Stanton's bike, and this is a Hall of Fame champions, past and present. We've got guys like Dave Clements, Jojo Keller, Jimmy Meenan, John Dowd, um, just some, some uh, Jimmy Ellis, the first guy to ever win an AMA championship. And the Taylor Kaplan poster, TaylorKaplan.com. We got to get that in. Of all these bikes on the left here, these are all bikes that we built here, frame up restorations from here to the, the door on the far end that we sold in the last few months. Everything from CR500s to um, KTMs and BMWs and everything on the right here are bikes that are actually for sale at KaplanCycles.com on eBay. If they're not for sale yet, they'll actually get listed this week. Um, some really cool one-off specials like this 500cc powered ATC because death with razors is for pussies. <laughs> uh, in, in, in this brand new 2017 with a brand new 2021 aluminum block CR500. This is, this is Moto 
um, the holy grail of, of motocross bikes. It's a built500.com. Take a look at that cylinder and the uh, engine cases, aluminum billet, just awesome. So. What you got there, T? Well, we've got a killer collection of jerseys and uh, mechanic shirts and other various event shirts um, throughout all the years. And I'm a little bit obsessed. It's one of my favorite sections in the entire museum. Um, of course, I guess as a girl, I have a little bit more appreciation for the fashion side of things <laughs> and seeing all the retro designs of everything. Um, I love it. And uh, one of my favorite pieces is, of course, this designation signed by Roger DeCoster, who dad, of course, is... I saw him yesterday, huge Roger fan. He gave me the thumbs Roger up when I was riding my 500. <laughs> um, I actually started the bike for Roger that he rode around the track at Unadilla a couple years ago. And Rick Johnson rode, rode my bike at uh, my CR500 on the Parade of Lap of Champions. Guys, if you have vintage motocross gear, we're always looking. If you look behind you, we've got hundreds of jerseys. We've got John Dowd jerseys. We've got um, Doug Henry jerseys. We're always looking for vintage jerseys and riding gear. And if it's not vintage, also new stuff. If you're a gear manufacturer, we're really into the whole red, white, and blue thing. So <laughs> if you want to do a Captain America edition, I'll buy the first set. So. Um, upstairs, we have the whole collection of old VHS, all the old moto movies, all the terra firmas, um, the uh, library. Great Outdoors, the library. Yep. That's my favorite. Um, there's also cool, a lot of cool little historical gems in the building. Um, like there are certain spots where you can see old handprints on the beams from where workers back when it was a textile mill would like leave their handprints and sign them and um, even like grooves in the floor where their feet from their feet from standing there for so long working uh, little things like that I think really add character to this building and add to the story it's not just some warehouse um, that was outfitted or some you know building that was outfitted to look historical to house this thing it really is <laughs> that historic and i love showing that off so that's probably some of my favorite things i want to see a little bit more and get the feedback on this guy right here so this kind of gives me the whole 2003 2004 2005 um, sort of setup of like the you know the factory Honda setups. Yeah, it's got Ricky Carmichael, Michael. Ross yeah, Ross exactly. And so th and this is when I was a young ki younger kid, like you know going to the going to the South Lake race, holding onto the fence, yeah. watching the, the Honda boys crush it. Um, what's some history behind this? Because this thing does not look stock, Ken. It, it is built by the guy who built the uh, the Doug Henry rebuilt the Doug Henry bike. He also did this one. And if you look at it from one end to the area, other, it looks like a factory bike. It's got the green DLC coated forks. It's got the billet, red anodized hubs. It's got the custom triple clamps. The frame is polished, aluminum radiators. Uh, the engine's been built from one end to the other. It's just bristling with trickery, as they say, you know? And it's fresh. It looks brand new, like it just came out of the box. Um, it says Fonseca on the tank. I'm not sure if this is a replica of his bike, but it very well, I believe that was the intention. I don't know how closely, because I, I didn't see Fonseca's factory bike, but the goal was to create a replica of his. Uh, and then we, we mentioned Baccarosa earlier, right behind you. This is one of Andrew and his dad, Pete's Baccarosa's bikes. This is a Vertimetti, which is a very rare Italian um, supermoto bike. 600, I think it's a 615, if I remember correctly. Absolute monster. And then we've got a brand new Cannondale. Those who uh, followed their rise and fall, they, they came, uh, they, they sponsored Keith Johnson, a local rider. And they didn't, they didn't make it, but they did create some really new tech, cool technology, like the reversed engine with the port, exhaust port coming out the back that Yamaha actually stole that design. And um, unfortunately, they ran out of money before they perfected it. The next bike over is actually Mike Guerra's factory Husqvarna. Mike Guerra is the first uh, local uh, pro to make it in the FIM World Series over, overseas. And this is back in 1980. This is the Unadilla cup, or you know, the plate. <laughs> it's a plate, but it's a sterling silver plate that he won for winning the, the uh, uh, AMA National at Unadilla. That's Welcome awesome. Back. Not many people have even touched one of these things. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool. It's uh, Mike's an awesome guy. He actually worked here buying bikes for the museum and for resale for a couple summers, but um, he's moved on. And we've got a YZ490 Yamaha. And then we've got a John Finkel Day special, local pro. I uh, got a second at the Southwood National in 1983 on a, on a bike pretty much the same as this. We see that a lot in the sandbox. Local guys mm -hmm. like Pat Barton actually got almost won the Southwood National. I think it was in 88. He crashed on the last lap while leading. We've seen Dowd, Henry, um, dozens of local guys. Guys like Chris Canning, who was uh, running what? 12th? 14, no, uh, he, was he finished 14th, I think? 14th overall, 14, 14. 14, 14. Um, <laughs> The YZ490, KX500. Then we've got 
one of the rarest big board two stroke sets of Suzuki RM500 there. And then we've got uh, the Red Rocket, the CR250R Honda. And um, one of the first electric motocross bikes with the Olin shocks on it right here. This is a friend of mine, Mark Summers bike, electric moto. This, this bike's probably 12, 13 years old. It um, was one of the cutting edge first, really fast. Not really my cup of tea. I like, I like to hear a two stroke. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? Um, not necessarily my style, but like a, a little bit of a Western sure. style. Yeah, this is for, you know, cowgirl down home. <laughs> That's why like Articat actually made that. That was a, a copy of the Rokon. Not the most comfortable ride, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys, you guys, is this ring a bell over here? That I, I know when T was a kid, she used to watch the cartoon all the time. And if you bought my calendar, you recognize this bike too, because this is in there as well. When's your, when's your next calendar coming out? Um, well, I shot the last one, like the first week of December of 2019. So hopefully I'll get a little bit early start on it. I've already planned it out a little bit, some locations and stuff. Not sure exactly when, but soon, not as late as last year. There was a team called Team Ninja Turtles in, uh, in New England here, and they actually donated this bike to display here. It's just here on display, but his name was Tommy Norton. The guy was an animal, uh, won multiple uh, New England and uh, national races. So here's, here's his jacket right here. How cool is that? Team Mirage. Ninja. I, I don't know how they ended up with the, the, the Mutant Ninja Turtles. Maybe he liked them when he was a kid. I don't know, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> Is Something you don't one? see every day. This is mine. I won this. I heard us being the best daughter. Yep. In the whole world. <laughs> Absolutely. This big cup. Best of show, Rockstar. Yep, best of show. <laughs> Feel like a happy baby. <laughs> so this, this next bike here actually has hay on it still. And you're wondering, well, geez, why, why does that hay on it? Well, the guy who wanted to display it at the museum wanted it. He goes, if he bought it in, I was like, do you want us to detail it? He goes, no, don't take the hay off of it. So it's actually got hay on it. Some, and sometimes it's like the coolest thing you see when you go, when, when you walk through the museum, everything looks pristine and mint, and then you got this one crusty little thing. So <laughs> it has character, you know? Humility. This is what we rode when we were kids, little Briggs and Stratton mini bikes. Because in the 60s, there was no such thing as a CR80 or a, a KX65. Uh, this was it, man. Briggs and Stratton, no suspension. My dad used to say, this is probably inappropriate, but I used to complain because we couldn't afford laid down shocks like everybody else had in the mid 70s because we were running leftovers from 74. He said, suspension is for pussies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, say that in a, in a factory pit now. <laughs> he just didn't want didn't to pony up and buy me a set of work performance shocks like all the rich kids had. <laughs> we were team low budget for sure. We used, to, we used to take our tires and, and we'd shave the knobs ourselves because we couldn't afford new tires. And we would take the chains off and we'd actually take the old motor oil and put them in a pot and cook them on, on, the, on, the, on the stove. So it heated up so it'd get inside the links and make it real good, you know? So, but those are the team low budget tricks and tips. Oh, hey, that could, that could save some money right there. Yeah, Saving a you know, couple bucks. You know, when, Ju <laughs> when Junior shows up on his Olin's suspended aluminum block CR500, I don't know if he appreciates he what, what, what we went through in our childhood. <laughs> So we still had fun though, even, even though I was grateful for my, my pops, who's my best friend. He's the one who got me obsessed with motorcycles and every weekend we'd go to the mini bike shop. Uh, there was a place called Brown Cycles and they sold mini bikes just like this. And that was like, what do you want to do today? What do I want to do every weekend? I want to go to the, to the mini bike shop and I want to go to uh, the store and get some, some, some Coke and some pistachios and, and uh, some motor dirt bike magazines. <laughs> when I was a little kid, and I'd sit up all night watching dirt bike magazines. And he did the same thing with us. He did not break the tradition. All he ever did was read magazines and sit there watching Jim Carrey movies or Austin Over Powers or like some 90s moto movie and eat pistachios and Coke. Yeah, pretty much. Nothing changed. Mine is the pistachio and Coke. Mine was uh, trail mix. <laughs> exact same thing. Exact same thing. I, I would beg my parents like I want the next trans world I want the next racer X yeah. and just sit there watching cartoons or, or a race flipping through it and just immersing myself was so. it Moto Kids do you remember was there a magazine called Moto Kids or and it's all or like 85s and stuff yeah, like that yep I remember yeah. that when, yep. I think it was like our generation yep. there was yep we always had those we had, well we would go to Cycle Gear and see you <laughs> and bother you to go get them <laughs> yeah, Dave worked in the bike shop right next to Kaplan Cycles which I spent more time in there than I did at the computer <laughs> shop I'm pretty sure it was for sale I should have bought it they sold the shop for 99 grand 
I should have bought it. Should have bought it, man. Yeah, it was really cool because Ken actually. Mask one more time. <laughs> Ken had some pretty cool shop, bikes though. there. What's that? <laughs> you had some pretty cool bikes in the shop. Oh like, hell yeah! Every time we walked through there, like, okay, yeah, we, this computers are cool, but like, I want to see that little KTM, man. What is that thing all about? <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> absolutely. So back to the magazines and books. We have probably the largest because of my obsession with magazines. I, I collected them. And I've got other people that have passed away or were moving that have donated their collections, really looking for hardbound motorcycle books. We talked about preserving the history, preserving the culture and passing it on to the next generation. I went to the local library, they had three hardbound books on motorcycles and all three of them sucked. So um, I wanted to create our own library here at the museum. When we purchased from Pratt & Whitney, they had mobile bookshelves on uh, wheels. So I bought eight of these massive eight foot long, seven foot high, mobile libraries and we're in the process of restoring them and putting all our books on display here so you guys when you come visit the museum if you want to see what did a 1974 xr 75 look like the day it came out of the box that'll be here preserved and i know a lot of it's online but there's something different about sitting down with a yeah and fresh touching cold it. soda and some yeah. sashes or you trail mix know, trail mix yeah there you go <laughs> and, and looking at the magazine you know and, and leaping your way through you want to check out the next floor yeah let's get to it let's do it One of the main, this is the second floor of the museum. You can drive motorcycles. The cool part about this building, it was built into a bank, I know, into a hillside. So we walked across the bridge. You can drive a motorcycle across the bridge, bridge into the third floor. You can drive into the second floor. And then of course the first floor is ground level because they didn't have elevators when this building was invented in 1814. The, the elevator was added in 1880 which is a whole other conversation piece actually. This row on the left here are, are vintage Indian motorcycles. This is a uh, former NYPD model right here. And then we've got the military police one right here. This one here is a 41. This one right here uh, is a model 741. It's a 500 CC V twin. So the, the machine gun is a replica of a 1928. Pretty cool piece. And we've got another Indian over here. It's a 47. And uh, on the right, we've got some pretty cool Harley Davidson. We've got a 77 XLCR cafe racer. It's a 1929 Harley Davidson in pink, and it seems to be the most favorite bike for the ladies to sit on and get their photos taken. Mm -hmm. This is a Harley Davidson shovel head, um, highly modified. If you're wondering where my hammer of justice came from, the guy who built this actually made, made me the hammer of justice. That's a whole other story, though. <laughs> from the, it's kind of a takeoff from the movie The Punisher. Yeah, okay, I can see it. I can definitely see the notes. Man, it's a Netflix series. This um, this here is a 1970 Harley Davidson service car, which was donated to the museum by the New Britain Police Department and restore un, under the condition one, we restore it, two, we never sell it, and three, every year they get to come here and do photo shoots. We got to keep it running for them. So we've up, that's, that was the deal. So Ken, when you have a bike that's so rare, like a lot of these, how do you go about getting like the parts and pieces you need to restore them? Because I know that can be a task all in itself is like just sourcing material you need to, to get them back to, you know, brands making new. The, the internet is our friend when it comes to searching. It's a full-time job for one guy and a part-time job for a couple other guys just finding parts here. Um, we call them project managers. When a bike comes in, they have to follow it. First thing we do is make the parts list because we don't restore bikes we can't get all the parts for. Otherwise, you end up with half restored bikes. So that's a whole nother... Uh, conversation the process of how we do it here but finding out right off jump street the missing components to make it whole and then trying to get it running and once you run it ride it to see if the transmission and everything works and then then we take them apart for the cosmetic restoration we try to get them mechanically intact before they're restored here's one of the original 86 gsxr 1000s it's called the slab side we talked about the super bike era from 73 to 86 that came a long ways and bikes like this were basically taken right onto the banks of daytona and they raced the, the Daytona uh, 200 national AMA national superbike races were done on this exact motorcycle. And yet we still have another 70,000 square foot of buildings that need to be restored. And I don't know if it'll happen in my lifetime. Hopefully it will, but if not, hopefully Taylor and Junior and, and the rest of the team will, will continue and uh, see the dream. I'd love to have this be a motorcycle franchise here like Triumph 
uh, Indy and Harley Davidson. I'd love to have motorcycle shops in these buildings and there's enough space to do it, but most of the local franchises are owned. So we'd have to either buy them or have them uh, decide to move in here. So someday hopefully we'll have some, some franchise businesses here. That'd be awesome to be a one-stop shop for pretty much all of your your museum needs, your memorabilia, your bike work, buying a brand new bike. I mean, that'd be- Restoring bikes. Yeah, that, that's the dream. We'll have a bar downstairs eventually, so. Restaurant, bar, microbrewery on the first floor. And a You'll motor- probably never want to leave. That's basically what we're getting at. I don't want to leave now. <laughs> There's a hotel in as well, one of the buildings. I don't want to leave now. Plus, you had me a food, so I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's so if we can see that come true, uh, the next thing would be a motorcycle restoration school to pass on the knowledge from us old dogs to you young, young, young guys and gals so that it can be passed on because there's the, the kids that are coming out of MMI today aren't being taught how to rebuild four, four cylinder carbureted motorcycles, it's all fuel injected stuff. So a motorcycle restoration school for classics pre Y2K is something we'd love to see happen here. So if you want to get involved, give us a call. We're always looking for volunteers or paid staff. We have openings in the, in the service department, um, motorcycle purchasing, motorcycle restoration. So there's a lot of opportunity we're growing.